Track Six, The Woman in White. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins, read by Tim Bulkley, of BigBible.org. Track Six. The First Epoch. Fourteen. Half an hour later I was back at the house, and was informing Miss Halcombe of all that had happened. She listened to me from beginning to end with a steady, silent attention, which in a woman of her temperament and disposition was the strongest proof that could be offered of the serious manner in which my narrative affected her. "'My mind misgives me,' was all she said when I had done. "'My mind misgives me sadly about the future. The future may depend, I suggested on the use we make of the present. It is not improbable that Anne Catherick may speak more readily and unreservedly to a woman than she has spoken to me. If Miss Fairley—' "'Not to be thought of for a moment,' interposed Miss Halcombe, in her most decided manner. "'Let me suggest, then,' I continued, "'that you should see Anne Catherick yourself, and do all you can to win her confidence. For my own part I shrink from the idea of alarming the poor creature a second time as I have most unhappily alarmed her already. Do you see any objection to accompanying me to the farmhouse to-morrow? None whatever. I will go anywhere and do anything to serve Laura's interests. What did you say the place was called? You must know it well. It's called Todd's Corner. Certainly. Todd's Corner is one of Mr. Fairley's farms. Our dairymaid here is the farmer's second daughter. She goes backwards and forwards constantly between this house and her father's farm and she may have heard or seen something which it may be useful for us to know. Shall I ascertain at once if the girl is downstairs?" She rang the bell, and sent the servant with his message. He returned, and announced that the dairymaid was then at the farm. She had not been there for the last three days, and the housekeeper had given her leave to go home for an hour or two that evening. "'I can speak to her to-morrow,' said Miss Halcombe, when the servant had left the room again. In the meantime, let me thoroughly understand the object to be gained by my interview with Anne Catherick. Is there any doubt in your mind that the person who confined her in the asylum was Sir Percival Glyde?" "'There is no shadow of a doubt. The only mystery that remains is the mystery of his motive. Looking to the great difference between his station in life and hers, which seems to preclude all idea of the most distant relationship between them, it is of the last importance even assuming she really required to be placed under restraint, to know why he should have been the person to assume the serious responsibility of shutting her up. In a private asylum, I think you said. Yes, in a private asylum, where a sum of money which no poor person could afford to give must have been paid for her maintenance as a patient. Ah, I see where the doubt lies, Mr. Hartwright, but I promise you that it shall be set at rest, whether Anne Catherick assists us to-morrow or not. Sir Percival Glyde shall not be long in this house without satisfying Mr. Gilmore, and satisfying me. My sister's future is the dearest care in life, and I have influence enough over her to give me some power, where her marriage is concerned in the disposal of it." We parted for the night. After breakfast the next morning an obstacle, which the events of the evening before had put out of my memory, interposed to prevent our proceeding immediately to the farm. This was my last day at Limeridge House, and it was necessary, as soon as the post came in, to follow Miss Halcombe's advice, and to ask Mr. Fairley's permission to shorten my engagement by a month, in consideration of an unforeseen necessity for my return to London. Fortunately, for the probability of this exercise, so far as appearances were concerned, the post brought me two letters from London friends that morning. I took them away at once to my own room, and sent the servant with a message for Mr. Fairley requesting to know when I could see him on a matter of business. I awaited the man's return, free from the slightest feeling of anxiety about the manner in which his master might receive my application. With Mr. Fairley's leave, or without it, I must go. The consciousness of having now taken the first step on the dreary journey, which was henceforth to separate my life from Miss Fairley's, seemed to have blunted my sensibility to every consideration connected with myself. I had done with my poor man's touchy pride. I had done with all my little artist vanities. No insolence of Mr. Fairley's, if he chose to be insolent, could wound me now. 
The servant returned with a message for which I was not unprepared. Mr. Fairley regretted that the state of his health that particular morning was such as to preclude all hope of his having the pleasure of receiving me. He begged, therefore, that I would accept his apologies and kindly communicate what I had to say in the form of a letter. Similar messages to this had reached me at various intervals during my three months' residence in the house. Throughout the whole of that period Mr. Fairley had been rejoiced to possess me, but had never been well enough to see me for a second time. The servant took every fresh batch of drawings that I mounted and restored back to his master, with my respects, and returned empty-handed with Mr. Fairley's kind compliments, best thanks, and sincere regrets that the state of his health still obliged him to maintain a solitary prisoner in his own room. A more satisfactory arrangement to both sides could not possibly have been adopted. It would be hard to say which of us, under the circumstances, felt the most grateful sense of obligation to Mr. Fairley's accommodating nerves. I set down at once to write the letter, expressing myself in it as civilly, as clearly, and as briefly as possible. Mr. Fairley did not hurry his reply. Nearly an hour elapsed before the answer was placed in my hands. It was written with beautiful regularity and neatness of character, in violet-coloured ink, on note-paper as smooth as ivory and almost as thick as cardboard, and it addressed me in these terms. Mr. Fairley's compliments to Mr. Hartwright. Mr. Fairley is more surprised and disappointed than he can say, in the present state of his health, by Mr. Hartwright's application. Mr. Fairley is not a man of business but he has consulted his steward, who is. And that person confirms Mr. Fairley's opinion that Mr. Hartwright's request to be allowed to break engagement cannot be justified by any necessity whatever, excepting perhaps a case of life and death. If the highly appreciative feeling towards art and its professors, which it is the consolation and happiness of Mr. Fairley's suffering existence to cultivate, should be easily shaken, Mr. Hartwright's present proceeding would have shaken it. It has not done so, except in the instance of Mr. Hartwright himself. Having stated his opinion, so far, that is to say, as acute nervous suffering will allow him to state anything, Mr. Fairley has nothing to add but the expression of his decision in reference to the highly irregular application that has been made to him, perfect repose of body and mind being to the last degree important in his case. Mr. Fairley will not suffer Mr. Hartwright to disturb that repose by remaining in the house under circumstances of an essentially irritating nature to both sides. Accordingly, Mr. Fairley waives his right of refusal, purely with a view to the preservation of his own tranquillity, and informs Mr. Hartwright that he may go. I folded the letter up, and put it away with my other papers. The time had been when I should have resented it as an insult. I accepted it now as a written release from my engagement. It was off my mind, it was almost out of my memory, when I went downstairs to the breakfast-room and informed Miss Halcombe that I was ready to walk with her to the farm. "'Has Mr. Fairley given you a satisfactory answer?' she asked as we left the house. "'He has allowed me to go, Miss Halcombe.' She looked at me quickly, and then, for the first time since I had known her, took my arm of her own accord. No words could have expressed so delicately that she understood how the permission to leave my employment had been granted and that she gave me her sympathy, not as my superior, but as my friend. I had not felt the man's insolent letter, but I felt deeply the woman's atoning kindness. On our way to the farm we arranged that Miss Halcombe was to enter the house alone, and that I was to wait outside within call. We adopted this mode of proceeding from an apprehension that my presence, after what had happened in the churchyard the evening before, might have the effect of renewing Anne Catherick's nervous dread and of rendering her additionally distrustful of the advances of a lady who was a stranger to her. Miss Halcombe left me with the intention of speaking in the first instance to the farmer's wife, of whose friendly readiness to help her in any way she was well assured, while I waited for her in the near neighbourhood of the house. I had fully expected to be left alone for some time. To my surprise, however, little more than five minutes had elapsed before Miss Halcombe returned. "'Does Anne Catherick refuse to see you?' I asked in astonishment. "'Anne Catherick is gone,' replied Miss Halcombe. "'Gone?' "'Gone with Mrs. Clements. They both left the farm at eight o'clock this morning.' I could say nothing. 
I could only feel that our last chance of discovery had gone with them. "'All that Mrs. Todd knows about her guests I know,' Miss Halcombe went on, "'and it leaves me as it leaves her in the dark. They both came back safe last night after they left you, and they passed the first part of the evening with Mr. Todd's family as usual. Just before supper-time, however, Anne Catherick startled them all by being suddenly seized with faintness. She had had a similar attack of a less alarming kind on the day she arrived at the farm, and Mrs. Todd had connected it on that occasion with something she was reading at the time in our local newspaper, which lay on the farm table, and which she had taken up only a minute or two before. "'Does Mrs. Todd know what particular passage in the newspaper affected her in that way?' I inquired. "'No,' replied Miss Halcombe. She had looked it over, and had seen nothing in it to agitate any one. I asked leave, however, to look it over in my turn, and at the very first page I opened I found that the editor had enriched his small stock of news by drawing upon our family affairs, and had published my sister's marriage engagement, among his other announcements, copied from the London papers of marriages in high life. I concluded at once that this was the paragraph which had so strangely affected Anne Catherick and I thought I saw in it also the origin of the letter which she had sent to our house the next day. And there can be no doubt in either case. But what did you hear about her second attack of faintness yesterday evening? Nothing. The cause of it is a complete mystery. There was no stranger in the room, the only visitor was our dairymaid, who, as I told you, is one of Mr. Todd's daughters, and the only conversation was the usual gossip about local affairs. They heard her cry out, and saw her turn deathly pale without the slightest apparent reason. Mrs. Todd and Mrs. Clements took her upstairs, and Mrs. Clements remained with her. They were heard talking together until long after the usual bedtime, and early this morning Mrs. Clements took Mrs. Todd aside, and amazed her beyond all power of expression by saying they must go. The only explanation Mrs. Todd could extract from her quest was that something had happened, which was not the fault of anyone at the farmhouse, but which was serious enough to make Anne Catherick resolve to leave Limeridge immediately. It was quite useless to press Mrs. Clements to be more explicit. She only shook her head, and said that, for Anne's sake, she must beg and pray that no one would question her. All she could repeat, with every appearance of being seriously agitated herself, was that Anne must go, and that she must go with her, and that the destination to which they might both betake themselves must be kept a secret from everybody. I spare you the recital of Mrs. Todd's hospitable remonstrances and refusals. It ended in her driving them both to the nearest station, more than three hours since. She tried hard, on the way, to get them to speak more plainly, but without success, and she set them down outside the station door, so hurt and offended by the unceremonious abruptness of their departure and their unfriendly reluctance to place the least confidence in her, that she drove away in anger, without so much as stopping to bid them good-bye. That is exactly what has taken place. Search your own memory, Mr. Hartwright, and tell me if anything happened in the burial ground yesterday evening which can at all account for the extraordinary departure of those two women this morning. Well, I should like to account first, Miss Halcombe, for the sudden change in Anne Catherick which alarmed them at the farmhouse hours after she and I had parted, and when time enough had elapsed to quiet any violent agitation that I might have been unfortunate enough to cause. Did you inquire particularly about the gossip which was going on in the room when she turned faint? Yes, but Mrs. Todd's household affairs seemed to have divided her attention that evening with the talk in the farmhouse parlour. She could only tell me that it was just the news, meaning, I suppose, that they all talked as usual about each other. The dairymaid's memory may be better than her mother's, I said. It may be as well for you to speak to the girl, Miss Halcombe, as soon as we get back. My suggestion was acted on the moment we returned to the house. Miss Halcombe led me round to the servants' offices, and we found the girl in the dairy, with her sleeves tucked up to her shoulders, cleaning a large milk-pan and singing blithely over her work. "'I brought this gentleman to see your dairy, Hannah,' said Miss Halcombe. "'It's one of the sights of the house, and it always does you credit.' The girl blushed and curtsied, and said shyly that she hoped she always did her best to keep things neat and clean. "'We've just come from your father's,' Miss Halcombe continued. "'You were there yesterday evening, I hear, and you found visitors at the house?' "'Yes, miss.' "'One of them was taken faint and ill, I'm told. I suppose nothing was said or done to frighten her.' 
"'You were talking of nothing very terrible, were you?' "'Oh, no, miss,' said the girl, laughing. "'We were only talking about the news.' "'Your sisters told you the news at Todd's Corner, I suppose?' "'Yes, miss.' "'And you told them the news at Limeridge House?' "'Yes, miss. And I'm quite sure nothing was said to frighten the poor thing. "'For I was talking when she was taken ill. "'It gave me quite a turn, miss, to see it, never having taken a faint myself.' Before any more questions could be put to her, she was called away to receive a basket of eggs at the dairy door. As she left us, I whispered to Miss Halcombe, "'Ask her if she happened to mention last night that visitors were expected at Limeridge House.' Miss Halcombe showed me by a look that she understood, and put the question as soon as the dairymaid returned to us. "'Oh, yes, miss, I mentioned that,' said the girl simply. "'The company coming and the accident to the brindled cow was all the news I had to take to the farm.' "'Did you mention names? Did you tell them that Sir Percival Glyde was expected on Monday?' "'Yes, miss. I told them Sir Percival Glyde was coming. I hope there was no harm in it. I hope I didn't do wrong.' "'No, no, no harm. Come, Mr. Hartwright. Hannah will begin to think us in the way if we interrupt her any longer over her work.' We stopped and looked at one another the moment we were alone again. "'Is there any doubt in your mind now, Miss Halcombe?' "'Sir Percival Glyde shall remove that doubt, Mr. Hartwright or Laura Fairley shall never be his wife. 15. As we walked round the front of the house, a fly from the railway approached us along the drive. Miss Halcombe waited on the doorsteps until the fly drew up, and then advanced to shake hands with an old gentleman, who got out briskly the moment the steps were let down. Mr. Gilmore had arrived. I looked at him when we were introduced to each other with an interest and a curiosity which I could hardly conceal. The old man was to remain at Limeridge House after I had left it. He was to hear Sir Percival Glyde's explanation, and was to give Miss Halcombe the assistance of his experience in forming her judgment. He was to wait until the question of the marriage was set at rest, and his hand, if that question was decided in the affirmative, was to draw the settlement which bound Miss Fairley irrevocably to her engagement. Even then, when I knew nothing by comparison with what I know now, I looked at the family lawyer with an interest which I had never felt before in the presence of any man breathing who was a total stranger to me. In external appearance, Mr. Gilmore was the exact opposite of the conventional idea of an old lawyer. His complexion was florid. His white hair was worn rather long and kept carefully brushed. His black coat, waistcoat, and trousers fitted him with perfect neatness. His white cravat was carefully tied, and his lavender-coloured kid gloves might have adorned the hands of a fashionable clergyman without fear and without reproach. His manners were pleasantly marked by the formal grace and refinements of an old-school politeness, quickened by the invigorating sharpness and readiness of a man whose business in life obliges him always to keep his faculties in good working order. A sanguine constitution and fair prospects to begin with, a long subsequent career, of creditable and comfortable prosperity, a cheerful, diligent, widely respected old age. Such were the general impressions I derived from my introduction to Mr. Gilmore, and it is but fair to him to add that the knowledge I gained by later and better experience only tended to confirm them. I left the old gentleman and Miss Halcombe to enter the house together, and to talk of family matters undisturbed by the risk of a stranger's presence. They crossed the hall on their way to the drawing-room, and I descended the steps again to wander about the garden alone. My hours were numbered at Limeridge House. My departure the next morning was irrevocably settled. My share in the investigation which the anonymous letter had rendered necessary was at an end. No harm could be done to anyone but myself if I let my heart loose again, for the little time that was left me, from the cold cruelty of restraint which necessity had forced me to inflict upon it and took my farewell of the scenes which were associated with the brief dream-time of my happiness and my love. I turned instinctively to the walk beneath my study window, where I had seen her the evening before with her little dog, and followed the path which her dear feet had trodden so often, till I came to the wicket gate that led into her rose-garden. The winter bareness spread drearily over it now. The flowers that she had taught me to distinguish by their names, the flowers that I had taught her to paint from, were gone, and the tiny white paths that led between the beds were damp and green already. I went on to the avenue of trees, 
where we had breathed together the warm fragrance of August evenings, where we had admired together the myriad combinations of shade and sunlight that dappled the ground at our feet. The leaves fell about me from the groaning branches, and the earthly decay in the atmosphere chilled me to the bones. A little further on, and I was out of the grounds, and following the lane that wound gently upward to the nearest hills. The old felled tree by the wayside, on which we had sat to rest, was sodden with rain. The tufts of ferns and grasses which I had drawn for her, nestling under the rough stone wall in front of us, had turned to a pool of water, stagnating round an island of draggled weeds. I gained the summit of the hill and looked at the view which we had so often admired in happier time. It was cold and barren. It was no longer the view that I remembered. The sunshine of her presence was far from me. The charm of her voice no longer murmured in my ear. She had talked to me on the spot from which I now looked down, of her father, who was her last surviving parent, had told me how fond of each other they had been, and how sadly she missed him still when she entered certain rooms in the house and when she took up forgotten occupations and amusements with which he had been associated. Was the view that I had seen while listening to those words the view that I saw now, standing on the hilltop by myself? I turned and left it. I wound my way down again over the moor and round the sand-hills, down to the beach. There was the white rage of the surf, and the multitudinous glory of the leaping waves. But where was the place on which she had once drawn idle figures with her parasol in the sand, the place where we'd sat together while she talked to me about myself and my home, while she asked me a woman's minutely observant questions about my mother and my sister, and innocently wondered whether I should ever leave my lonely chambers and have a wife and a house of my own? Wind and wave had long since smoothed out the trace of her, which she'd left in those marks on the sand. I looked over the wide monotony of the seaside prospect, and the place in which we two had idled away the sunny hours was as lost to me as if I had never known it, as strange to me as if I had stood already on a foreign shore. The empty silence of the beach struck cold to my heart. I returned to the house and garden, where traces were left to speak of her at every turn. On the west terrace walk I met Mr. Gilmore. He was evidently in search of me, for he quickened his pace when we caught sight of each other. The state of my spirits little fitted me for the society of a stranger, but the meeting was inevitable, and I resigned myself to make the best of it. "'You're the very person I wanted to see,' said the old gentleman. "'I had two words to say to you, my dear sir, and if you have no objection I will avail myself of the present opportunity. To put it plainly, Miss Halcombe and I have been talking over family affairs affairs which are the cause of my being here, and in the course of our conversation she was naturally led to tell me of this unpleasant matter connected with the anonymous letter, and of the share which you have most creditably and properly taken in proceeding so far. That share, I quite understand, gives you an interest which you might not otherwise have felt, in knowing that the future management of the investigation which you have begun will be placed in safe hands. My dear sir, make yourself quite easy on that point. It will be placed in my hands. You are in every way, Mr. Gilmore, much fitter to advise and to act in the matter than I am. Is it an indiscretion on my part to ask if you have decided yet on a course of proceeding? So far as it is possible to decide, Mr. Hartwright, I have decided. I mean to send a copy of the letter, accompanied by a statement of the circumstances, to Sir Percival Glyde's solicitor in London, with whom I have some acquaintance. The letter itself I shall keep here to show to Sir Percival as soon as he arrives. The tracing of the two women I have already provided for, by sending one of Mr. Fairley's servants, a confidential person, to the station to make inquiries. The man has his money and his directions, and he will follow the women in the event of his finding any clue. This is all that can be done until Sir Percival comes on Monday. I have no doubt myself that every explanation which can be expected from a gentleman and a man of honour he will readily give. Sir Percival stands very high, sir, an eminent position, a reputation above suspicion. I feel quite easy about the results, quite easy, I am rejoiced to assure you. Things of this sort happen constantly in my experience—anonymous letters, unfortunate woman, sad state of society. 
I don't deny that there are peculiar complications in this case, but the case itself is, most unhappily, common, common. I am afraid, Mr. Gilmore, I have the misfortune to differ from you in the view that I take of the case. Just so, my dear sir, just so. I am an old man, and I take the practical view. You are a young man, and you take the romantic view. Let us not dispute about our views. I live professionally in an atmosphere of disputation, Mr. Hartwright, and am only too glad to escape from it, as I am escaping here. We will wait for events. Yes, yes, yes. We will wait for events. Charming place, this. Good shooting? Probably not. None of Mr. Fairley's land is preserved, I think. Charming place, though, and delightful people. You draw and paint, I hear, Mr. Hartwright. Enviable accomplishment. What style? We dropped into general conversation. Or rather, Mr. Gilmore talked, and I listened, and from the topics on which he discoursed so fluently. The solitary walk of the last two hours had wrought its effect on me. It had set the idea in my mind of hastening my departure from Limbridge House. Why should I prolong the hard trial of saying farewell by one unnecessary minute? What further service was required of me by any one? There was no useful purpose to be served in my stay in Cumberland. There was no restriction of time in the permission to leave which my employer had granted me. Why not end it there and then? I determined to end it. There were some hours of daylight still left. There was no reason why my journey back to London should not begin on that afternoon. I made the first civil excuse that occurred to me for leaving Mr. Gilmore, and returned at once to the house. On my way up to my own room I met Miss Halcombe on the stairs. She saw by the hurry of my movements and the change in my manner that I had some new purpose in view, and asked me what had happened. I told her the reasons which induced me to think of hastening my departure exactly as I have told them here. No, no, she said earnestly and kindly. Leave us like a friend. Break bread with us once more. Stay here and dine. Stay here and help us to spend our last evening with you as happily and as like our first evenings as we can. It's my invitation. Mrs. Vase's invitation. She hesitated a little and then added, Laura's invitation as well. I promised to remain. God knows I had no wish to leave even the shadow of a sorrowful impression with any one of them. My own room was the best place for me till the dinner bell rang. I waited there until it was time to go downstairs. I had not spoken to Miss Fairley, I had not even seen her all that day. The first meeting with her when I entered the drawing room was a hard trial to her self control and to mine. She too had done her best to make our last evening renew the golden bygone time, the time that could never come again. She had put on the dress which I used to admire more than any other that she possessed a dark blue silk, trimmed quaintly and prettily with old-fashioned lace. She came forward to meet me with her former readiness. She gave me her hand with the frank, innocent goodwill of happier days. The cold fingers that trembled round mine, the pale cheeks with the bright red spot burning in the midst of them, the faint smile that struggled to live on her lips and died away from them while I looked at it, told me that what sacrifice of herself her outward composure was maintained. My heart could take her no closer to me, or I should have loved her then as I had never loved her yet. Mr. Gilmore was a great assistance to us. He was in high good humour, and he led the conversation with unflagging spirit. Miss Halcombe seconded him resolutely, and I did all I could to follow her example. The kind blue eyes, whose slightest changes of expression I had learnt to interpret so well, looked at me appealingly when we first sat down to table help my sister. The sweet anxious face seemed to say, help my sister, and you will help me. We got through the dinner, to all outward appearance at least happily enough. When the ladies had risen from the table, Mr. Gilmore and I were left alone in the dining-room, and a new interest presented itself to occupy our attention, and to give me an opportunity of quieting myself by a few minutes of needful and welcome silence. The servant who had been dispatched to trace Anne Catherick and Mrs. Clements returned with his report, and was shown into the dining-room immediately. "'Well,' said Mr. Gilmore, "'what have you found out?' "'I found out, sir,' answered the man, "'that both the woman took tickets at our station here for Carlisle.' "'You went to Carlisle, of course, when you heard that?' Yeah, "'I did, sir. But I'm sorry to say I could find no further trace of them.' "'You inquired at the railway?' "'Yes, sir.' 
Uh, and at the different inns? Yes, sir. And you left the statement I wrote for you at the police station? I did, sir. Well, my friend, you've done all you could, and I've done all I could, and there the matter must rest until further notice. We've played our trump cards, Mr. Hartwright, continued the old gentleman when the servant had withdrawn. For the present, at least, the women have outmanoeuvred us, and our only resource now is to wait till Sir Percival Glyde comes here on Monday next. Would you fill your glass again? Good bottle of port, that. Sound substantial, old wine. I have got better in my cellar, though. We returned to the drawing-room, the room in which the happiest evenings of my life had been passed, the room which after this last night I was never to see again. Its aspect was altered, since the days had shortened and the weather had grown cold. The glass doors on the terrace side were closed, and hidden by thick curtains. Instead of the soft twilight obscurity in which we used to sit, the bright radiant glow of lamplight now dazzled my eyes. All was changed, indoors and out. All was changed. Miss Halcombe and Mr. Gilmore sat down together at the card-table. Mrs. Vesey took her customary chair. There was no restraint on the disposal of their evening. And I felt restraint on the disposal of mine all the more painfully from observing it. I saw Miss Fairley lingering near the music-stand. The time had been when I might have joined her there. I waited irresolutely. I knew neither where to go nor what to do next. She cast one quick glance at me, took a piece of music suddenly from the stand, and came towards me of her own accord. "'Shall I play some of those little melodies of Mozart's which you used to like so much?' she asked, op opening the music nervously, and looking down at it while she spoke. Before I could thank her, she hastened to the piano. The chair near it, which I had always been accustomed to occupy, stood empty. She struck a few chords, then glanced round at me, and then looked back again at the music. "'Won't you take your old place?' she said, speaking very abruptly and in very low tones. "'I may take it on the last night,' I answered. She did not reply. She kept her attention riveted on the music, music which she knew by memory, which she had played over and over again in former times without the book. I only knew she had heard me. I only knew that she was aware of my being close to her, by seeing the red spot on the cheek that was nearest me fade out, and her face grow pale all over. "'I'm very sorry you're going,' she said, her voice almost sinking to a whisper, her eyes looking more and more intently at the music, her fingers flying over the keys of the piano with a strange, feverish energy which I had never noticed in her before. "'I shall remember those kind words, Miss Fairley, long after to-morrow has come and gone.' Paleness grew whiter on her face, and she turned it further away from me. "'Don't speak of to-morrow,' she said. Let the music speak to us of to-night, in a happier language than ours." Her lips trembled. A faint sigh fluttered from them, which she tried vainly to suppress. Her fingers wavered on the piano. She struck a false note, confused herself in trying to set it right, and dropped her hands angrily on her lap. Miss Halcombe and Mr. Gilmore looked up in astonishment from the card-table at which they were playing. Even Mrs. Vesey, dozing in her chair, woke at the sudden cessation of the music, and inquired what had happened. "'You play at whist, Mr. Hartwright?' asked Miss Halcombe, with her eyes directed significantly at the place I occupied. I knew what she meant. I knew she was right. And I rose at once to go to the card-table. As I left the piano, Miss Fairley turned a page of the music, and touched the keys again with a surer hand. "'I will play it,' she said striking the notes almost passionately. I will play it on the last night. "'Come, Mrs. Vesey,' said Miss Halcombe. "'Mr. Gilmore and I are tired of Eckhart's. Come and be Mr. Hartwright's partner at whist.' The old lawyer smiled satirically. His had been the winning hand, and he had just turned up a king. He evidently attributed Miss Halcombe's abrupt change at the card-table arrangements to a lady's inability to play a losing game. The rest of the evening passed without a word or a look from her. She kept her place at the piano, and I kept mine at the card-table. She played unintermittingly, played as if the music was her only refuge from herself. Sometimes her fingers touched the notes with a lingering fondness, a soft, plaintive, dying tenderness, unutterably beautiful and mournful to hear. Sometimes they faltered and failed her, or hurried over the instrument mechanically as if their task was a burden to them. But still, 
change and waver as they might in the expression they imparted to the music, their resolution to play never faltered. She only rose from the piano when we all rose to say good-night. Mrs. Vasey was nearest to the door, and the first to shake hands with me. "'I shall not see you again, Mr. Hartwright,' said the old lady. "'I am truly sorry you are going away. You have been very kind and attentive, and an old woman like me feels kindness and attention. I wish you happy, sir. I wish you a kind good-bye.' Mr. Gilmore came next. "'I hope we shall have future opportunity of bettering our acquaintance, Mr. Hartwright. You quite understand about the little matter of business being safe in my hands? Yes, yes, of course. Bless me, how cold it is. Don't let me keep you at the door. Bon voyage, my dear sir, bon voyage, as the French say." Miss Halcombe followed. "'Half past seven to-morrow morning,' she said, and then added in a whisper, "'I've heard and seen more than you think. Your conduct to-night has made me your friend for life.' Miss Fairley came last. I could not trust myself to look at her when I took her hand, and when I thought of the next morning. "'My departure must be an early one,' I said. "'I shall be gone, Miss Fairley, before you—' "'No, no,' she interposed hastily. "'Not before I am out of my room. I shall be down to breakfast with Marian. I am not so ungrateful nor so forgetful of the past three months.' Her voice failed her. Her hand closed gently round mine, and then dropped it suddenly. Before I could say good-night, she was gone. The end comes fast to meet me, comes inevitably, as the light of the last morning came to Limeridge House. It was barely half-past seven when I went downstairs, but I found them both at the breakfast-table waiting for me. In the chill air, in the dim light, in the gloomy morning silence of the house, we three sat down together and tried to eat, tried to talk. The struggle to preserve appearances was hopeless and useless, and I rose to end it. As I held up my hand, as Miss Halcombe, who was nearest to me, took it, Miss Fairley turned away suddenly and hurried from the room. "'Better so,' said Miss Halcombe, when the door had closed. "'Better so for you and for her.' I waited a moment before I could speak. It was hard to lose her without a parting word or a parting look. I controlled myself. I tried to take leave of Miss Halcombe in fitting terms. But all the farewell words I would fain have spoken dwindled to one sentence. Have I deserved that you should write to me?" was all I could say. You have nobly deserved everything I can do for you, as long as we both live. Whatever the end is, you shall know it. And if I can ever be of help again, in, at any future time, long after the memory of my presumption and my folly is forgotten, I could add no more. My voice faltered. My eyes moistened in spite of me. She caught me by both hands. She pressed them with the strong, steady grasp of a man. Her dark eyes glittered, her brown complexion flushed deep. The force and energy of her face glowed and grew beautiful, with the pure inner light of her generosity and her pity. I will trust you. If ever the time comes, I will trust you as my friend and her friend, as my brother and her brother. She stopped, drew me nearer to her. The fearless, noble creature touched my forehead, sister-like, with her lips, and called me by my Christian name. "'God bless you, Walter,' she said. "'Wait here alone and compose yourself. I had better not stay for both our sakes. I had better see you go from the balcony upstairs.' She left the room. I turned away towards the window, where nothing faced me but the lonely autumn landscape. I turned away to master myself, before I too left the room in my turn and left it for ever. A minute passed, it could hardly have been more, when I heard the door open again softly, and the rustling of a woman's dress on the carpet moved towards me. My heart beat violently as I turned round. Miss Fairley was approaching me from the further end of the room. She stopped and hesitated when our eyes met, and when she saw that we were alone, then, with that courage which women lose so often in the small emergency, and so seldom in the great, she came nearer to me strangely pale and strangely quiet, drawing one hand after her along the table by which she walked, and holding something at her side in the other which was hidden in the folds of her long dress. "'I only went to the drawing-room,' she said, to look for this. It may remind you of your visit here, and of the friends you leave behind you. You told me I had improved very much when I did it, and I thought you might like—' She turned her head away, and offered me a little sketch. 
drawn throughout by her own pencil, of the summer-house in which we had first met. The paper trembled in her hand as she held it out to me, trembled in mine as I took it from her. I was afraid to say what I felt. I only answered, It shall never leave me. All my life long it shall be the treasure I prize most. I am very grateful for it, very grateful to you for not letting me go away without bidding you good-bye. Oh, she said innocently, how can I let you go, after we've passed so many happy days together? Those days may never return, Miss Fairley. My way of life and yours are very far apart. But if a time should come, when the devotion of my whole heart and soul and strength will give you a moment's happiness, or spare you a moment's sorrow, will you try to remember the poor drawing-master who taught you? Miss Halcombe has promised to trust me. Will you promise too? The farewell sadness in the kind blue eyes shone dimly through her gathering tears. I promise it, she said in broken tones. Oh, don't look at me like that. I promise it with all my heart. I ventured a little nearer to her, and held out my hand. You have many friends who love you, Miss Fairley. Your happy future is the dear object of many hopes. May I say at parting that it is the dear object of my hopes, too? The tears flowed fast down her cheeks. She rested one trembling hand on the table to steady herself, while she gave me the other. I took it in mine, I held it fast. My head drooped over it, my tears fell on it, my lips pressed it, not in love, oh, not in love, at that last moment, but in the agony and the self-abandonment of despair. "'For God's sake, leave me,' she said faintly. The confession of her heart's secret burst from her in those pleading words. I had no right to hear them, no right to answer them. They were the words that banished me in the name of her sacred weakness from the room. It was all over. I dropped her hand. I said no more. The blinding tears shut her out from my eyes, and I dashed them away to look at her for the last time. One look, as she sank into a chair, as her arms fell on the table, as her fair head drooped on them wearily. One farewell look, and the door had closed upon her. The great gulf of separation had opened between us. The image of Laura Fairley was a memory of the past already. The End of Hartwright's Narrative End of Track 6